without further ado, here comes Captain Q. Put it together for him. Hello, Captain. Oh, what's very nice. I got. I think I'm getting applauses, or else somebody's slapping me in the face. What is that? I guess that's applause. <laughs> <laughs> it's a clap. Uh, she's. It's a clap. She's a. Oh, uh, thanks very much. Yeah. Hi, guys. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome to uh, PS126 in Manhattan. Uh, this kind of teleportation device that we are using, it's really exciting. Um, these students have seen you on YouTube. Uh, we are all very big fans. Um, I think just to kind of get things rolling, I'm going to ask you if you could just kind of tell us about your background uh, your relationship with sailing. How did you come to sailing? And um, if you are so inclined, how did you come to be uh, a YouTube presenter of sailboats? Let's see. This is an all-day course. Is that right? So we're yeah. We're we have about seventeen 20, hours. Twenty-four hours. Yeah. Next twenty-four <laughs> hours. <laughs> uh, let me ask one question here. But how old is our, our, our uh, the students here that we have here today, roughly? An 11, 12. Okay, that's that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> because um, I originally started, I learned to sail when I was 11. And so just your age. And one summer I was very lucky. Uh, I was sent away to a, uh, a, a camp where it was called Tabor Academy up in Massachusetts, Marion, Massachusetts. And you learned to sail there. And you learned a lot of other things. You learned to tie ropes and make half models and uh, build little racing sailboats. And when I came away from that camp, uh, <clears throat> went home again, I was fully enthused about sailing. And I actually bought my first book back then because I had to know more about what other sailboats were out there. And we were just sailing in a little, uh, they were called wood pussies. They were designed by Philip Rhodes, who's a famous yacht designer. And uh, uh, they were just fun. It was just one sail, just the mainsail, and uh, you had the tiller in your hand, and that was it. And, and you'd sail all over this little harbor, and there were a whole bunch of us. We just had a great time doing it. So that's where I started. And then uh, we happened to have a, a little sailboat uh, left from a power boat that my father had. And uh, it was a sort of a dinghy that the, he hung off the back of his power boat. And then he sold the power boat, but he kept the dinghy. So uh, I took that out and sailed that on a lake south of Buffalo, New York, where I grew up. And uh, uh, had a great time with that. Tried to drown myself a couple of times, but survived. It, 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 it floated. And then after that, it was just anything I could get onto, any sort of sailboat, anything with, with some rags hanging on it, uh, I would try to get on and go sailing. And uh, uh, it just went on from there. Uh, I ended up in the Navy for a brief period of time and learned how to navigate ships and then uh, actually part of my Navy career, I was made a sailing instructor in Newport, Rhode Island. I taught sailing in the Navy. And then later on, um, I was married and uh, moved on to a sailboat. And uh, uh, we lived on a sailboat for a couple of years until our daughter was born. Hold up. And what kind of sailboat did you live on for a couple of years? Well, it's funny you should ask. And let me see if this will help uh, because I have a picture. Now, let's see. How does that work? Can you see that? Is it That's pretty gloss? good. Yeah, it's it's glossy. Uh, get, I got a better picture here. How's this one? How does that work? Is that better? That's lovely. Now that's a forty-four foot steel catch. See, there's two masts, and it's a catch because the the second mast is uh, shorter than the first mast, but it's also the placement of it because it's actually you can see here a little more clearly. That is uh, me when I was considerably younger and my wife, my wife is steering there and uh, uh, the catch, you see the, the, the second mast is behind the rudder. If you can imagine the rudder in the boat's toward the back of the boat. Mm -hmm. And so this, this catch is in front of that <laughs> rudder post. And the way I always remember that is that the mizzen mast sort of catches the rudder. Okay. Like catches or catches anyway. Huh. So that's, and then there's a yaw, which is a, what uh, my my favorite boat was was a yawl, and that's the boat right behind me, right there. I don't know if you can see that. Does yes, that show we pretty can. well, uh, or not? What kind of boat is that? That's a that was a fifty two foot yawl. Uh, it was actually a sloop originally, but it was designed by a man named William Tripp, Bill Tripp, out in Long Island, and uh, 
He was a very famous yacht designer, and uh, I, I I bought the boat, and then uh, eventually put a second mast in it because I happened to like yawls. I see. And that's the that's another study, another time. Oh, by, by the way, here's one of the here's the other first boat again. There's another kind that, of pretty that was picture. The, of it. the forty. You said a forty four foot steel catch. This that's what this one and is. And what yeah. kind of what what was the manufacturer of that? Uh, it was uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think. It was it was in the Netherlands. It was built in Holland. Uh, with a, a Dutch designer and a Dutch uh, boatyard. Not Van der Stad. No, but it's funny you dropped that name because E.G. Van der Stad, uh, my father had a lot of business in Europe uh, for a number of years. And so he would go to these boat shows over there and um, he would he would buy a boat and, and he'd make some money and then he'd take the money he made and he'd buy a little boat. And he brought back uh, two different, well, three different boats. One was a 24-foot uh, sloop which I'll have, I'll show you an exciting picture <laughs> of me about you guys age, maybe one year older sailing. Th this is how we like to sail on boats back in those days. So that's me right here, this guy. And uh, we were climbing up on the side of the boat. We got very excited because the boat would sort of heel over. And yeah. uh, so we thought, well, what great fun. We'll just hang off the side of the boat. And that's one of my old schoolmates uh, who came to visit me one time. But that boat was just 24 feet long and it was made out of wood and it was designed by Bondestad. And then later uh, he sold that boat and then he bought two more boats, uh, a 28 foot boat, uh, which was beautiful. The Dutch do absolutely extraordinary work uh, on paint work and on varnish work and woodwork in their boats. They're really, they're, they're beautiful. They're like pieces of furniture. And, uh, but we like, we tried to race them. And unfortunately the boat, as beautiful it was, and it was extremely seaworthy, was very slow. So dad thought, well, uh, I, I guess if, if a 28-foot boat is too slow, I'll buy a 35-foot boat. So he bought a 35-foot boat. Turned out that boat <laughs> wasn't much faster. And uh, so he gave up on that. And that was a steel boat built and designed in Holland by uh, E.G. van der Stadt. And then uh, he came back to this country, and he decided he wanted to buy a bigger boat. So he talked to Mr. Tripp, William Tripp, this man who uh, lived and kept his office out on Long Island on the uh, oh, Oyster Bay area. Maybe some of you know, might know of. I think he was out that way. Anyway, uh, so uh, <clears throat> he went around with Mr. Tripp looking at boats all over the country to buy. And he, we, he actually looked at, surprisingly enough, this boat right here. That was one of the first boats he looked. I fell in love with it. I was with him at the time. I said, hey, Pop, that's a really cool boat. You should buy that boat. But he didn't. He bought another boat. He bought a boat that was built in Maine by the Hinkley Company, called the Hinkley 48. And we went out and raced that boat. And that was another great cruising boat. But she was uh, not the fastest. <laughs> so he tried one more time. And he ended up buying a uh, boat that was 57 feet long, designed by Mr. Tripp. And um, he sailed that, and then my father got very old, and not many years later, he passed away. So his son, this guy right here, uh, came along and said, oh, I need a sailboat. How about that boat that I saw many years ago, about 20 years ago? Uh, I wonder if that boat's for sale anywhere. And I found it. It was sitting in a little boatyard in Massachusetts. It was all covered with, with uh uh, old oily tarps and things. It was really, it was like, you know, you had to kind of look under it and see what the hell was going on. And it was really tired and old and the varnish was tired and the paint was tired. And so <clears throat> I said, that's just the boat for me. So I bought the boat and I ended up living with that boat. I fell in love with that boat and it was my whole life for about 18 years. And we sailed that and raced it. We did, we did okay. We collected, uh, we, well, we're down in the man cave here. I'll just show you this. This isn't a big deal, and, but Maybe, I don't know, can you see that? Uh, and up on the top shelves there, there's a bunch of old tin cups that people gave us because we oh, did yeah. pretty well in some of the races and so forth. But that, um, that we just had a great fun with, time with, and she was a beautiful boat. Uh, the one thing about sailboats for me is that they, they have to be really pretty. They're kind of like cars, you know. Uh, I don't know how many of you are car buffs or not, but you know, if you, if you just have sort of a quite as good old New York Ford, City. You know, that's nice. You drive the Ford and they're great cars. They'll get you from A to B. But now let's imagine, just pretend you were lucky enough to end up with, let's say, a Porsche. 
Now, every time you get out of that Porsche, you're going to walk into the store. But before you get into the store, you're going to turn around and look at that car and say, oh, I love that car. It's really great. I love it. It's a beautiful car. And you might even feel that way about your Ford, but more likely about the Porsche. And so that's the same thing with sailboats. Uh, to me, the boat had to have lines that were pleasing and that those lines were also functional. Uh, there is a, uh, a school of architectural design uh, that rose up in Germany many years ago, the Mihaus, uh, no, the Bauhaus, Bauhaus School of Design. And I think one of their platitudes was uh, form follows function. And that meant that if you built something that really worked well, it was going to be pretty too. And it was going to be attractive to the human eye. So uh, that's kind of the way I feel about sailboats is that if you build something that's going to function well, it's also going to be fun and pretty to own. Indeed. Uh, yeah. I want to interject for a second. First of all, because pretty much every single uh, boat designer name you have mentioned so far, I, I mentioned to you earlier that we spoke to Bob Perry last week. Um, yes, yes. Every single name that you've mentioned so far, he listed as one of his uh, big influences. So uh, those boats are all in very good company. The second thing, uh, Austin was wondering about what year was it when you were living, I believe, on the 44 foot catch? Oh, how, I, I just, how far just, back yeah. are we talking here? I just realized we had this, this side page here. I'm sorry, Austin, I did not see that. I don't know where you are here. Uh, oh, there you are. Uh, and, and Phil, uh, oh, anybody can interrupt anytime they want to, because one thing you have to understand, you see see the white eyebrows, and you see the see this, uh, this desert on the top of my head? That means I'm getting pretty old, and so old guys tend to talk a lot. And you've got to <laughs> say, hey, wait a minute, stop. I want to hear something else. So feel free to interrupt me, okay? I'd be very happy to have you interrupt me, and it would not be considered impolite. So please, please do that. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, um, what year was that you said that we were on that boat? Was that the question? Yeah, I think so. Uh, um, my wife and I were married in 1975, uh, and it was a very cold day in November, and we got on this boat that we had bought, and we had to have some work done to it. I don't know, I feel like my camera's over on this side of the screen. Why am I looking that way? I don't know. <laughs> this technology is very confusing for me. Look that doesn't work, does it? I'm still looking at it. Anyway, so we moved on to the boat in November up in Long Island Sound, and we went down right through New York, through the Hell's Gate, and down the uh, East River, and we waved goodbye <clears throat> to some friends who were standing on the East Side Drive over there, and we motored off. Uh, out of out of the harbor, out of New York Harbor. And the first night, now I back up one second, I've sailed in my life, as I just told you, my wife had really not sailed at all. I think she had been on maybe a little thing at a beach one time or something, that was about it. So she really didn't have any experience at all. And uh, that is uh, this person right here. So where is she? There she is, steering the boat. So we sailed down and um, Tell me if you all know where Sandy Hook is by any chance. Does that ring a bell? Is this it, is uh, this is a piece of land at the top of New Jersey there. And Sandy Hook is kind of a little hook of land. It's kind of like that. Right. And uh, if you if you sail down into it, usually the let me do this. <laughs> I can get my hook the right way. Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll have the wind uh, coming in this way. So if you sail down out of the New York Harbor like so, and you come in and you drop an anchor, and uh, anybody stop me if I say any words that you don't know or you don't understand what I'm talking about. Just say, hey, whoa, whoa, what's that? What's an anchor? But anyway, you drop an anchor right here, and uh, then you're protected from the wind that's coming out of the uh, south and so forth. Well, that was fine. Well, we came down there the very first night we were married, and we're sitting on the boat, and we dropped the anchor right here, and the wind was coming in from offshore. Okay, it's called offshore. Well, and we had that. We sat down, had dinner, and we had a little glass of wine. And it was really very pleasant. But then we went to bed, and we were sleeping up in the bow of the boat, and in an area called a V berth area. And maybe you've you've seen that on some of the boats we've looked at. When we watch your videos together, I I have been annotating them in the comments on the right hand side. So whenever well, you drop uh, a term that Randy doesn't put in a subtitle for, I try to I try to give my own little subtitle. Oh, good, good. I I, I don't think I can see that. I guess, but anyway. Uh, so, so anyway, there we are. We've come down. We've just been married. We've gone through New York, waved at everybody, and we come in and we anchor inside Sandy Hook. Well, that night, after we went to sleep, the wind, instead of, where's my finger going? The wind, instead of coming this way, turned around and came out of the northwest. So it was blowing right into the hook. 
in there. And suddenly the bow of the boat where we're sleeping is going up and down like this. Oh my God, I, we're sleeping right up here in the bow of the boat. And, uh, and all of a sudden I can hear the chain dragging against the hull. And I said, oh, what's going on? So I got up and I went outside and it was pouring rain. It was really windy. And um, I have a habit of being on a boat and uh, extracting blood out of my body. I managed to hit my <laughs> thumb or my nail or my head or something. And I start to bleed. I guess I have thin skin. So uh, I went up there and I fiddled around with the chain and I got us all turned around so the boat was comfortable and settled down. But then when I came below decks, my wife was, it was the middle of the night here, of course. My wife looked at me and I had blood coming down on my forehead and it was, it was, it was, it was, I was soaking wet and so forth. And I, and I got all dried off and, uh, and she was very brave. She said, okay, here, I'll help you. And she got me on, dried up and cleaned up and I went back to bed and the boat uh, sat happily for the rest of the night. Now, <laughs> the next morning we got up and we set sail. We went around the corner and down the coast of New Jersey. Uh, heading toward Cape May, which is beyond Atlantic City. And so on the way down there, she looked over at me at one point and she said, well, that was quite an interesting night. Is it like that every night? <laughs> and I said, no, it's not like that every night. Usually it's quite peaceful. So her, her initiation into her first night of sailing was um, a lot of noise, a lot of wind, and her new husband bleeding and soaking wet and uh, listening to chains cranking up on the bow. So um, it, was, it was quite an experience for us. So she's gotten over it and uh, we've lasted together for, oh, quick math time, about 47 years. Well, congratulations. So that's a that, good that, chunk uh, of time. That really speaks a lot about how strong she is. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so I, let's see, we have about 20 some odd minutes. Um, I'm just going to quickly turn to some of the questions that I had students ask in advance. I have them up on a, on a sidebar here. Um, one of them was, have you ever experienced a catastrophe while sailing? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> there are different levels of catastrophe in right. this world. Uh, usually you kind of think of one that's going to impale your life or change your life in some way. Yeah, I think uh, I, I would interpret this to mean um have you ever lost a boat let's say i have never lost a boat no i've lost parts of a boat mm -hmm. uh, my very first race uh offshore off in really deep water was a race from newport island newport rhode island excuse me to uh, bermuda and i didn't know the owner of the boat but uh somebody had told him that he needed a crew for the boat and and uh, uh it was a 40 foot yaw remember the the taller mast is the, sh the aftermast is a little shorter than the taller mast. And it was made out of wood, a beautiful boat, and it was designed by Sparkman and Stevens in New York City there. And I didn't know uh, that they were based the out of New York. What's that? Were they based out of New York? I didn't know that. Yeah, they were originally. Um, and uh, I, they're now currently, I think they've, the company's been sold, but that's another story for yeah. another time. But anyway, so um, I, I got myself to Newport, Rhode Island, and I found the boat, and it was a really pretty boat. And uh, so we left and we got to go, we're, we're sailing from um, Newport, which is, uh, I, I, need a, I need a white pad here or something, but anyway, uh, I'll just take my word for it for now. Yeah. We're going from Newport, which is up here near the top of my forehead. And we got to sail down to my nose, which is, there we go. That's where Bermuda is. So we have to go straight south down to Bermuda. And it's about 600 miles. And the whole time we were sailing down there, here's our boat, we're sailing along. And the wind was, I gotta think for a second here, uh, the wind was coming over the right side of the boat. So we were on what's called a starboard tack. Does that ring a bell? Yep. Oh, okay, so we're on a starboard tack. So the whole boat is kind of heeling over to port the port side. Now, when a boat heels over, you have the mast, which is sticking up here, okay? And let's get the master right. Oh, my, gotta get the boat right, heeling over now. So there's the mast. And the rigging that goes down to the deck is very tight. But the rigging on the other side of the boat, because the mast will bend a little bit, gets slack. It's just sort of loose. So the wind had been increasing, and we've been sailing this way for about three days or so. We were about 200 miles away from Bermuda. And the wind was picking up. So the captain said to me, uh, he said, Alan, would you go forward 
and put on a, a different jib, a, a different jib up in the bow of the boat, something that was made out of heavier cloth that would take the increased wind pressure. And I said, sure. So I went up and we hanked that on and we hoisted it up. And, uh, it's, and I'm standing now right beside the mast. Okay, I'm right, here I am. There I am standing right beside the mast and the boat's heeling over. And then we tack. And just as we tack, you know what happened then? All this shroud and rigging got uh, light and, and floppy, but all the rigging on the other side of the boat went steel rod hard, okay? And when it was really tight, now there's, they try to save weight up in the air on a, on a mast, on a boat. Anytime they can save any kind of weight up here, uh, they're, in, they're making the boat less likely to tip over. If I put a big weight up here, whoo, that boat would tip right over, wouldn't it? Well, they do it in small increments as well. In other words, small pieces. So they took the rigging, the design of the rigging was, they took a heavy piece of wire that went up about halfway, and then they took a lighter piece of wire to go the, the rest of the distance because it didn't have to have as much load on it. Now, when they do that, there is, at that at place where they come together, there is a, uh, a clevis uh, with a clevis pin that goes through it like so, okay? And then underneath where my fingernail is, there's a little cotter pin. Have you all seen cotter pins? Does that ring a bell? So anyway, so there's a there's a clevis pin in there, and the clevis or the a cotter key in the clevis pin. The cotter key had obviously worked its way out. So all that's holding these two things together is the clevis pin. Oof. And when the when the when the wire went tight, it stretched it out, and all of a sudden I heard something like a 22 uh, rifle go off and went ding like that. And what happened, this thing just got squeezed out and shot right over the side. Now, so I'm, 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 there we are now on a starboard tack, okay? And here's all the wire going up here. Suddenly there's no wire holding the mast up, right? Oh my God. So what do you think happened? Boink. <laughs> no oh, mast. Man. The mast went right over the side of the boat and it cracked all the way down to the winches, the winches uh, that, are, that hoist the sails up the mast. And uh, the mast cracked right about there, if you see that little line in the pen. Where was the mast stepped? The mast was stepped all the way through the deck. Wow, and it still went down. Oh, oh absolutely, yeah. There's, there just wasn't enough support on it. Yeah. And uh, there was a fairly light, light mast because it was designed for racing, so it wasn't a big tree. Right. And somewhere in the other room there, I have a picture of that mast. When we got to the dock, it looked like this. Uh, <laughs> there was... The, the two masts, or the, the, the upper section, the lower section set just like that. Okay, yeah. Down about here, and here was the broken piece that came down from the top. That used to be up here somewhere, right? Right. So anyway, that's kind of a catastrophe. And then uh, I've fallen overboard a number of times, but that's, that's another story. Oh, um, well, you just answered another question that a student had, which was, have you ever gone overboard? <laughs> I have about uh, three times, actually, in my life. Uh, the most exciting one, though, uh, you'll like, well, it was in a, uh, a race from Boston, Massachusetts to Nova Scotia, to Halifax, Nova Scotia, called the Marblehead Halifax Race. And we were uh, charging down uh, toward Halifax. We weren't far out, but we had everything up. I thought I had a, I should have a, I've got a great, well, let me see. Can you see? If you look back at the, uh, no, that's just, that's not the rig. Uh, I have a great shot of everything up. We had the spinnaker. Do we all know what spinnakers are now yet? Have we we haven't about learned about spinnakers spe specifically, but do you want to tell them or shall I? About spinnakers? Yeah. Oh, you go ahead and tell them, please. So a spinnaker is a drink big, of water here. giant head sail, which kind of looks like a balloon or an umbrella that catches a lot of air. And um, that's about all I know. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Uh, a lot of the early spinnakers were, were sort of derived from parachutes. And that kind of an idea of yeah. just having something as big as you possibly could, and you put it out in front of the boat, and you're going down when it blows it over. Well, we were sailing down there. Sometimes when you're going downwind, the boats will rock back and forth, kind of like this. They rock on the waves. And one time, we were having a little problem steering. This is kind of complicated, but you just have to imagine you're having a hard time making the boat go straight but you have to keep the wind right behind your boat the whole time. So while wow, there's big balloons up there, well, we didn't do that at one point and we took what's called a knockdown, a crazy knockdown. And we got the whole boat rolled over right on our side, just like that, right on our side. 
Now I was sitting, <laughs> I was sitting on the lower side of the, well, it was the higher side, but then it became the lower side. And I was sitting down there and all of a sudden this giant wave came rolling right down the deck because half the boat was sort of went underwater and came down and it blew me off the boat right under the lifelines, which are the wires that go up and down the boat to keep you on board. I went right over the side and it was kind of funny because there I was, this boat weighed about 35,000 pounds. That's 17 tons. That's like, uh, let me just think for a second. That's like seven of your parents' cars. You know, that's how much the boat weighed, a very heavy boat. And I went over the side, except that there was a little rail along the side of the boat. I call it toe rail, but in this case, it was a heel rail. My heels and my shoe on both feet just caught on that rail. So here's the rail, and here's the heel of my foot right on that rail, right? And uh, <clears throat> I'm underwater. The boat is on top of me. We're doing about eight or nine knots through the water. So we're still going sideways now with me underwater. And this, and is, underwater, not, this is not what? warm bath water. This is quite a bit well, chillier. It's, it's, it, it, it's not too, too bad up there. It wasn't icy, icy, but it was it's North Atlantic a little bit. So right. it wasn't all that bad. That part wasn't bad. But here's the funny thing. I had my glasses on, my sunglasses on. And just before we left, I had purchased something called a croaky. Does anybody know what a croaky is? Raise your hand. No? Nope. <laughs> croaky is nothing more than a string that goes from one end of your eyeglasses to the other. And you, when you put it on, you put the little cord behind your head. So if you want to take your glasses off, people take them off. And they just want to hang them around their neck like that. Right? I did not know that that was the name for that. Well, that was the uh, um, brand name of the company that made them. I see. I had just bought one of these croquis. I never had one before. A little thing slips on the end of that. And so I had had that on with a croquis on. So there I am. You kind of have to picture. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> but I'm underwater. Do I look like I'm underwater? Sure. There's <laughs> anyway, some water behind you. Oh, I look up, and all of a sudden, my glasses come floating off my head. And I'm, <laughs> the water's going by me. Right. Can you see this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the water's going by me, and also I see my glasses come off my face, and they stop right about there. You notice that? See that? Mm -hmm. The croquis were working. And they, <laughs> they, they were holding my glasses up. And I'm thinking, here I am under the, under the boat. You know, it's, it's underwater. But the only thing that comes to my mind is that my croquis are working, and they saved my sunglasses. <laughs> and the next thing I know, a big hand came down off the boat and grabbed me by the shirt and hauled me back up on the boat. And uh, we finished the race. We actually got the gun, which, which means that you are the first boat to finish. And uh, these boats are raced under a handicap system of sorts. And we'll probably explain that, uh, Mr. Z can explain that sometime, but uh, we also won on time and we won overall. And- uh, Well, congratulations, that sounds heroic. <laughs> it was really very exciting having <laughs> survived. When the boat popped up, Fortunately, because we had prepared the boat well enough to go sailing that distance, nothing broke and everything worked. And there, all the rest of the crew, I think we had eight people on board that day. Uh, they all survived and, and, and uh, it was a good day. Amazing. Uh, got something else here? Uh, one of the students who is not in this class intuited. He said, it seems like you were in the Navy. If I understand correctly, for how long were you in the Navy? He wants to know. That was very intuitive, I would say. Yeah. And it's fortuitous that he was so intuitive yeah. because I happen to have an answer for him. <laughs> Back. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. We uh, pause for this brief message. Hello, and I'm sorry. I'm on. I'm on a a live telecast with some students in New York. We're having a great time. I am anyway, and I hope they are. Thank you. Bye bye. That was the owner of one of those uh, hair shop sloops that we discussed in our last latest episode. Ah, okay. No, that the fan hair shop design? Uh, I will look that up. No, I, I misheard you as saying hair shop, as in a oh, shop. Oh, not hair shop. Hair. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's terrible. You wouldn't believe uh, anyway, what I could do to the English language on this <laughs> technology is terrible. So um, uh, back in the late, in, in the 50s and 60s, there was a war over in, in Asia and, and uh, and then it escalated to what we've come to know as the Vietnam War. And I was a student at the time, and then my student uh, uh, deferment ended, and I was drafted into the Army. And I said, well, I don't really want to get shot uh, in the Army, but I said, if they're going to shoot at me, I'll do it in the Navy, because I like being on the water. So I joined the Navy. 
And I went to boot camp out in Chicago in the dead of winter. And you would have gotten a kick out of this because uh, when you go to boot camp in the Navy, it's not very tough. It's not like becoming a Marine. I would never say that. But uh, <laughs> everybody laughs if, if you've been to boot camp in Chicago in the winter because you've got to wash all your clothes. You know, you wash your sheets, you do all this stuff and you do it yourself. And then when you're finished washing them, you take them and you hang them outdoors and you tie them up with, you know, special little sailing lights, like little square knots on it, okay? And then you hang it. Now, then you go back inside. When you come back out, uh, you can't believe it, but your sheet is now totally stiff, okay? You can pick it up. It's frozen, totally frozen. Yes. And you take that sheet in and you would lean it up against your bunk like that, and then eventually it would sort of melt and then sort of dry and then fall down. <laughs> So that's how we had to wash our sheets in the Navy. Not very tough, but it was fun doing it. I, so I after, would imagine it shattering or something. Yeah, well, it was very funny to see that thing happen like that. It was not, uh, but I, I enjoy, I get very enthusiastic about things that I get into because I think that's what life is a, a, a lot of fun with. So the more you can throw yourself at life and, and, and enjoy it, it's fun. But anyway, after that, once you go to basic training, then they send you to school. And I was sent to a school to learn how to navigate and uh, to navigate on big ships and you'd use a sextant and so forth and, and uh, tell you how far the sun is up and it tells you where you live and where you are. And when I got and when I got out of school, they said, we need somebody to help us down at the officer's club where we have a, a, a place to teach sailing. We need somebody to teach sailing. Would you do that? And you know, so when I was great. I said, sure, I volunteer. I'll be glad to go teach sailing while I'm in the Navy. This is good duty. So I spent the whole summer, and that was the summer of 1969. I spent the whole summer uh, teaching sailing to aircraft pilots and also to nurses and, and other you know, uh, members of the military that needed to learn how to sail. We sailed on a Rhodes 19, which is a keel boat, and a really nice stable boat with a nice comfortable cockpit. We had a great time. Then one day, uh, <coughs> An admiral's aide, that's somebody who works for an admiral. That's the guy who's, you know, admirals have like admin people or secretaries. And this admiral's aide uh, called down to our operations office and he said, uh, the admiral would like to have one of these boats, these 30 foot boats that I used to take out and race every weekend. They were called a Shields, S H I E L D S. Uh, another Sparkman Stevens design, very pretty boat. And uh, the man in the, in, in the, in the, that answered the phone said, oh, I'm sorry, they're all booked for the weekend, uh, but maybe Seaman Q, and I was very low. This, this is how, see how, am I at the bottom of the screen here? Yes, you are. That's how low you are when you're a Seaman. When you're an Admiral, you're up here somewhere. So I was really low down here. And he said, they're all taken, but maybe Seaman Q would take the Admiral sailing with him. And the Admiral's aide was furious. He said, oh, he'll never do that. Anyway, the Admiral's aide called back a little while later and said, well, the Admiral said he'd like to go sailing with Seaman Q. So he came down. Uh, sailing was originally canceled because it turned out to be very foggy, and he didn't know if we could navigate. So he, the Admiral came down and said, well, well, I'll go sailing with you, Q, but do you think we can navigate in this fog? And I said, aye, aye, sir. We can do that. So now I was sailing the boat. I was the captain of the boat, okay, of this little 30-foot sailboat, and the Admiral uh, was giving me directions where to steer, you know, how to go, how to steer the boat. Uh, also, sadly, and I don't do it anymore, but I smoked a lot back then, I'm afraid. And unfortunately, I stopped 30 years ago, but um, at the time, I had to smoke. So I'm sitting down there, tailing the boat, I got a sugar in my mouth, and the Admiral is lighting cigarettes for me on the windward side of the boat and handing them to me so that I could keep racing. So we sailed out around the harbor, went out the ocean and came back in. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, out of the fog, is this huge rock. And we're headed right for this rock. And fortunately, at the last minute, I threw the helm over and the boat spun and we shot out and we just missed the rock. We did actually, in the bottom of a wave, you know, you can have a high point of a wave and then you have the, the low part of the wave and then there's the high point and the low part. Right at the bottom of one of those waves, the bottom of our boat actually touched, uh, actually hit the bottom of, 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 the, of, the, of the sea for a split second. And then we turned and went out. So we finished. We went back. And we we were sailing back to the to the uh, to the officers' club, and the admiral looked over at me and said, um, "You did a good job sailing there, Q." And he said, um, "But I don't think we will mention this touching to anybody." Now that's a very funny story, actually, because touching when you're in the navy and you have a great big aircraft carrier, 
I think some of you have been designing aircraft carriers, but if you've got a big aircraft carrier and you take that aircraft carrier and you run up on the ground, they like to refer to that as touching. Now, there's touching, there's touching, right. and then there's also hitting your aircraft carrier on the ground, two different things. Anyway, he was a wonderful man, and he helped me get reassigned to my next assignment, which was go down to Annapolis to the United States Naval Academy, where they made me a yacht keeper, which was somebody that takes care of big sailboats. And there was a 72 foot catch, remember? Second mass is pretty tall, not as tall as the yaw. I mean, taller than the yaw, but anyway. And uh, this was 72 feet long, beautiful boat. Oh, would you like to see a picture of that? Sure. There she is. I just happened to have a picture. Oh, excuse me, see dog. She's an awfully good dog, though. Anyway, take a look at this one, guys. Ooh. What do you think about that? Is that gorgeous? Teak for weeks. That is just a beautiful boat. Anyway, that was the boat that I was stationed on. One day, when this boat was tied up in a boat yard in the winter, all the water around it froze. And so the, the guy that I was working for in the Navy said, here, take this bag of ice. And he said, put this big bag of ice over your shoulder and go out, excuse me, bag of salt, not ice, bag of salt. Put the bag of salt over your shoulder and drop salt all the way around the water on this boat. So I took, has anybody here ever walked on ice besides a hockey rink? Okay. If you walk on ice that's got water under it and you, you go out and all of a sudden you, you take one step and you say, that wasn't going to be a good step. And sure enough, I took a step and went whoop, right through the ice with a 50 pound bag of ice on, of, of uh, salt on my back. And um, they thought I was in real trouble. It wasn't too bad, but they took me to the hospital and they said, uh, you're going to survive, but we just noticed that there's something wrong with your back. And uh, they got a big long word for it. And that you should not have been let into the Navy in the first place. So I said, all right, what does that mean? And uh, they said, they said, you're out of the Navy. So I had the good luck, very good luck and dumb luck, I guess you might say, of being uh, the only person to spend the entire uh, Vietnam War uh, on sailboats. And uh, so, yes, I was in the Navy for a year and a half out of a four year hitch. And that's that. But, but don't tell anybody about that. They might think <laughs> they might think that uh, the government didn't spend their money right way on. Uh, no, how could anybody ever get that idea? I see why Austin looked like Austin just popped on here. And uh, did he have something else he, he wanted? Or, or Austin, do you he... have another question? Um, my question would be like, what was the, what was the, like, have, have you been in a hurricane before? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, again, uh, <laughs> I seem to run into little things in my life somewhere around Bermuda. Uh, and coming back from Bermuda one time after a race, I had uh, my children on board and I had the TV back here and it started to blow up and it started to get windier and windier and windier. So we took down most of our sails and I took the boom and I, I lowered the boom right down to the deck and strapped it onto the deck and I, I got everything. So no matter what happened uh, when, the, when the storm hit, nothing was going to blow around on the deck and all the lines you have to get everything really secure um you can't have stuff flopping around on deck or below deck I mean, and i always made sure the boat was very quiet below deck meaning that no cupboards were open i mean there's nothing worse than going down there in a storm and stepping on a jar of mayonnaise, mayonnaise or something so coming back this one time uh the wind built up until finally it was blowing about 60 miles an hour and uh, it was really pretty amazing um, the boat was so well set up, though, that we didn't have any problems. And she just, she sat there. We actually hove to, is the phrase. And there's one for you, <laughs> Mr. Z. You can tell him about heaving to and what, what's involved with that. Oh, I look but forward to it. it. It's just a way of quieting the whole boat down a little bit, even in the worst of storms. And uh, so it wasn't a hurricane. I went, it was close to it. I think that's a whole gale at that point. Something like that, like one layer below hurricane. But we came out of it. We, we sat there all night, heaving to, and survived. Um, and the next time I was anywhere close to a hurricane was I was tied to a dock up in Maine, and the hurricane blew into Portland and actually blew over our boat, so we didn't get hit by anything. So that's about it, Austin. So I, I can't give any more exciting. But there, 
Uh, there's there are great books out there, and I, and just before I came on this channel, I was talking with a man who was sailing off the bottom of Africa, off of Cape Town down there, and the horrible storms he was in down there. So there's there's uh, there are lots of storms out there, but most of the time, probably 95 percent of the time, you are going to have beautiful sailing no matter where you are in the world. Really. Fantastic. Well, um, I will. Uh, Thank you, Austin. Thank you for your question. One person asked, what is the longest period of time you have been on a boat at once? I guess that's uh, the longest, longest period of time you've been at sea. Well, you mean without ever getting on the land? Yeah. Probably. Probably a race to Bermuda about uh, one. I did it one time. We did about five days. The another time we had a very slow race. We did, it took about seven days maybe before us to get there. So no ocean but, crossings. It just ocean crossing. That's a little over 600 miles going from Rhode Island to Bermuda. Got it. Um, there have cool. been other other times when I've sort of lived on the boat practically. Um, I, I, I lost a brother in a plane crash. And shortly after that, I, I moved on to the boat and spent a lot of time there. But I would. Uh, sail the boat and race the boat and had a great time with it and uh, but that took like a number of months so i just lived on the boat off and on off and on and so forth it was it was wonderful it was a great a great time for me i'm very lucky yeah i'm sorry about the circumstances that's no. un, unimaginable a long um, time ago about yeah. 30 years yeah. Whew, can't believe it uh let's see um i think that uh, probably a lot of our students are wondering about your youtube show that you do and how that got going and um maybe a little bit about that oh gosh whatever you care tell you to guys, tell us i think everybody on my screen right now knows more about technology and youtubes and everything than i have ever known or probably ever thought i would ever know and i still don't know very much about it but i had a very good friend who sailed with me on the pb right here for about 10 or 15 years and he was very young when he came on the boat and now of course he's a little older he's about 50 but he's very he's very techy he's really super brain and one day he came to me last summer and he said hey captain uh i got an idea why don't uh you know a lot about boats sort of and i said yeah i know something i know more than some people but a lot less than others but i said uh, he said you know a lot about boats why don't i get a camera and we'll take a picture of you talking about boats. And I said, well, that'll be about as exciting as watching grass grow, I think, right? You know, let's go, <laughs> let's go watch the lawn grow outside. And he said, no, really, really, really. And, and people will even give you some money. I said, really? They're going to give you some money? He said, yeah, do this. Uh, and uh, I said, this is the silliest thing I've ever heard of. But I had been driving by in my course of my, my day, I'd been driving by this old white boat. It was having to be a Cal 28. And it was really tired, and the owner it was starting to grow grass under it and everything. And the owner just wanted to sell it, get it out of there. And I said, well, let's go take pictures of this boat. We'll talk about it. So we went over there, and he said, okay, I, there we go. We shot it, and I talked about the boat. And uh, then he said, we've got to do four more. I said, why do we have to do four more? He said, because when, we, when you put something onto YouTube, uh, if somebody comes along and they like it, then they're going to want something more right away. And if you don't have something else out there to keep them excited, then they kind of drift away and that's the end of them coming to visit you. So I said, okay, so we did four more boats, a total of five. And we put them out there, I think about October 1st, somewhere around October 1st, just this past October. And I, we, we, when you do that, when you, uh, and, and again, you guys probably all know this, but they have something called analytics, which is a, something in YouTube gives you to help you analyze what's happening with your program. You find out who's looking, what time they're looking, you know, are they short people, tall people, uh, and so forth, and what country are they from, um, and so on. And so all this information comes out. So we were watching it, and, that's, and in the first few nights, wow, we had like seven or eight people looked at our channel. We thought, this is, wow, who's listening? Really seven or eight. Then we we're like 20 or something. So this went on for about a month, 10 here, 15 there, 10, 11, 12. Well, finally, all those days, the first month, it added up to about a thousand people eventually had looked at it over a course of a month, over a whole month, a thousand people had looked at it. We thought, are you kidding me? So we thought that was great. Well, apparently with YouTube, once you put something up there and 
somebody over in YouTube world says, these guys are pretty smart, or this is a really clever YouTube. Uh, let's monetize them. Anybody raise their hand know what monetizing is? I didn't. So I'm going to raise my hand. I didn't know what it was either. But what it means is that YouTube uh, says, this is really cool. So we're going to recommend uh, somebody that has a business to put their ad on this Captain Q channel. So the next thing we know, we have ads coming on the channel. And when that happens, suddenly our whole system exploded. And on the first day that happened, we went from like 50 to 30 um, views to uh, I think the first day was like 7,000 views in wow. one day. We went, oh my gosh, oh my God. Even Sea Dog, Sea Dog was totally blown away. And uh, so we started doing that. Then we went off and we started doing more and more of these. And we found that uh, we've now just passed um, 4 million views of people that have looked at 4 million different views of this silly program. And we have about 40,000, a little short of 40,000 subscribers. And those are just people who want to come see a program again and make certain that they, they find out the next program's coming on. So that's how it sort of grew, and that's what we're doing. And we get little ads, and we do this for free, basically. Our program is that we will go around and look at boats, and we'll say, oh, that's a really nice boat right there. You've got this nice orange boat. We like that. And uh, we'll tell people about it. Well, you've seen the you've seen the channel. I don't want to bore you with that, but uh, but we do that for free. But then if somebody out there, like one of you guys, says, "Hey, I really like that boat. Why don't we buy it?" And then we show them where you know down here. They always point to the bottom of the, of the YouTube picture, and you go down there and you find a broker or an owner of the boat, and you call them and you say, "I'll take that boat," and then they sell the boat. We're really happy to see that happen. Um, and in the meantime, YouTube send us. A little bit of money to pay for our gasoline and our McDonald burgers. Very nice. I a lot of McDonald's when you're on the road with it. <laughs> One thing that's been really great uh, that we've kind of talked about a little bit in class has been uh, kind of like some of the barriers to entry that exist for sailing and boating in general. And um, I'm just wondering if I could get your opinion on like, what are some of the, the things that make it difficult for people to get into boating? And what would you like to see change so that uh, the community of boaters grows to include more of the community of people in general? Oh, gosh. You know, I haven't Kind of given a big that... question to hit you with. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's, a, that's <laughs> an interesting question. There's all sorts of things. I was thinking about this today, actually, for, for your students. And I don't know. Uh, uh, you guys are, what, where are you and what, what, what street are you in New York? We are, we are in Chinatown in New York. Okay. Well, I'm just thinking that, um, uh, if you, anybody ever get up to Central Park, you, you guys must get up to yeah, Central yeah. Park from time to time out there. From time to and time. And in Central Park, have you seen the pond there with the sailboats on it? Yes. Okay. You have. Okay. So I'm not telling you anything new, uh, because you can go on that, on that, uh, uh, go look at, at the boats out there and talk to the people sailing them and you can watch and see how the boats move and what happens with the winds coming and you really get a, a nice feeling with your feet dry and no seasickness or anything and um, you can kind of just understand what's happening when we talk about boats sailing and tacking and jiving going downwind uh, it's a, a that's a really easy way for you right in the city to do that the next thing you do is just find there, there are places that will teach sailing. If you can get, uh, get an instructor to help uh, you learn to sail. Um, for, well, one other step in here too, very important in my life is reading. There is, uh, I, I just, I can't get enough books about reading. There's a book on rigging your boat. Um, I've got, wait, you just saw a minute ago. Here's, here's a book on, on different types of sailboats for sale read as much as you can go to the library and get all these i, I have a tendency to, to buy books because i like to use them for my own library my own reference point um so uh but you don't have to do that you just go to the library take out a book and learn about and read about it. that's how my father learned to sail my father grew up in the middle of this country in, in kansas and there's not a lot of big water out in kansas not a lot of water period and so uh do that and then uh you'll You'll, you'll find uh, many times there are little organizations around where there's, there's little clubs and the people are racing their boats. And there's small boats. There's small boats. There's big boats. There's all sorts of things. But there's one thing a captain likes to see 
is somebody come down to the boat and knock on their deck and say, uh, I'd be happy to come sail with you. Can I come be rail meet? We're used to refer to it in some cases because sometimes you don't know that much about sailing, but they need the weight of your body sitting up on the high side of the boat so it doesn't tip over. So that's called rail meet. But uh, in doing that, you will learn to sail and you'll learn the lines, you get the terminology, and it's a great way to get your feet wet. Um, so there, I don't know what, what pro, there must be other programs around New York and certainly out in Long Island Sound, there's, there's a ton of them. But just get anywhere near there's a sailboat and then raise your hand and say, uh, count me in, I'm ready to go. One thing I always recommend, especially to our students who enter seventh grade and they start thinking about high schools, is there is a high school here called the New York Harbor School, which is located on Governor's Island, just south of Manhattan. And you take the ferry there every day and they have a sailing club and you can join the sailing club and learn to sail. And by the time you finish high school, you've had four years of experience doing it. Oh, that's a, that's a great idea. I don't, I don't know about that school, but that, that sounds like a, a, a perfect way to get get your feet wet, as I say. So um, just any anytime you see a sailboat, go find it and go talk. You just, if you walk down to, oh, there's a marina down uh, at the end of Battery Park, probably not far from you guys. Yeah, right? that's... Um... Well, uh, sometime maybe take a few of your students or something, go down there and just stand on the dock. And the first thing you do when you get down there, now listen to me very carefully, all those who are left, I think we've lost a few. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, all those of you left, when you get down, you're standing next to that boat. The first thing you do, you see the guy that looks like he's in charge, maybe the captain, maybe the owner, and you look at him square in the eye and you say, boy, is that a beautiful boat? <laughs> he is going to love you. He's, and he's immediately going to say, oh, you want to see my boat? And he will invite you aboard the boat and you'll get to see it and touch and feel and just see you know, what it's like to live on many sized boats. It can, almost any size boat. They'll, they'll, they, they love it, sailors especially. Try not to talk to too many motor boaters because they're not much fun. But <laughs> sailors, sailors, sailors are where the fun is. You heard it here, guys. You should do that. Uh, I'll probably get letters from all the motor boaters in the world. <laughs> and I spend um, a lot of time that, motor That's boats. interesting, though. Like the that kind of what is it about people who sail specifically uh, as opposed to people who who prefer to motor? I, I know a lot of people as they get older they go from sailing to motoring because of uh, some of the physical intensity involved in sailing. Um, but what is there something there to kind of explore that difference? Uh, there's something about a sailboat. In one of the episodes, we finally got on a boat to go sailing this spring, and I, I, I just saw that. And I, uh, we had the owner on board as well, but I was, I was steering the boat. And when you sit down, and you've got the sails trimmed just right, and the boat's heeling over a little bit, and the sun is shining, and you're sliding through the water, and it's very quiet, just a little gurgling of the water as it goes by the hull. It's really, it's, it's, it's like a religion almost. It's almost a religious experience, and you just think, wow, gosh, this is great. And then when you think about it, too, the thing that always, always amazed me is that it's like you're moving this whole house through time and space, right? And you're on it. You're directing this whole house from over here to over there, and and you and, and if you look down into the cabin, I remember one night on a night passage on the PB back behind here. We were. It was um, I don't know probably one of the runs on Nova Scotia. Uh, it was dark on deck, and the interior of that boat was really beautiful. It was all done in old, rich uh, African cherry mahogany. And if you turn on any of the lights below deck, it, the, the wood almost looked like like it was glowing. Uh, and so here you, we're going through this night, and I'm behind the wheel steering the boat, and I could look down into the into the cabin, and down inside that cabin, people are moving around, and they're getting in bed, and they're making some food, and they're doing stuff. And meanwhile, this boat's just going right through the water, and it's just it's it's just it's just crazy crazy beautiful crazy time and um, you just thank your lucky stars that you're on that boat at that moment and it doesn't have to be that big a boat it can be a smaller boat I, i'm just telling you about particular experiences here so um there's really something indefinable and if you catch the bug if you catch the sailing bug you will never regret it never ever regret it you'll just uh, and you'll want to pass it on to your children grandchildren and everything it's it's the best well, thank you so much. I think we're going to close on that amazing image that you just painted for us. 
Captain Q, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your experience and wisdom and thoughts with us. Uh, this has been really great. You and I talked earlier, and I think uh, we agreed that we could easily talk for a much longer period of time. So I hope that we will get a chance to do that again in the future. It's been an absolute privilege and an honor to have you with us uh, on behalf of the whole sixth grade class and Austin, who is still our uh, remaining oh, cool, Austin. <laughs> friend with us. <laughs> Just awesome. We're fisting awesome. Yeah, fist. fist bumps. There we go. There we go. Oh, you got a double fist. <laughs> oh, well, I think you are, I think you are a marvelous, uh, Mr. Z, to do all this stuff for the kids and uh, introduce them to this world. And if, if even one of them comes away with uh, something that changes their life, I hope that would be fun. That would be really neat. I concur. Yeah, Thank fun. you. I'd be happy to come back and see you sometime if, if uh, there's anything else I can do or if you want to have another Q&A sometime. It would be, be my pleasure. I enjoy this. Q&A. I like that. <laughs> That's a Captain Q and A. Captain Q and A, <laughs> fantastic. All right, uh, we'll okay, sign off for now and uh, have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. You guys too. Bye. 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 Have a good day. Bye. Bye. See you, buddy.